We used to have Easter baskets. We used to color eggs. Come on. Yep. <clears throat> Can I get a witness to this? Yes. <clears throat> Some of you are going to be doing that in the days ahead. You're going to be purchasing Easter baskets <clears throat> and things like that. I'm not going to give anything away. The Easter Bunny is the one that's going to bring those kids. Okay. <clears throat> I don't need anybody writing. I don't need any bad press afterwards. I gave something away. So the Easter Bunny's going to come that night before Easter and deliver those baskets. When I was a kid, there was something else that happened on Easter. <clears throat> we got new clothes. We didn't get new clothes all year long. My family was not rich. We wore what we had, and sometimes they got a little high water as we grew, but we kept wearing them. <clears throat> I, we weren't that poor, but I, you know, I, I've heard people say that, that, that they were so poor that they wore out their, their, their red ball jets. I heard one kid say he's the only kid at school that had cannabis spats. <laughs> Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about. <clears throat> I'm, getting, I'm getting the deer in the head like this. But we got a new outfit. Mom would get a new dress. Dad would get a new suit. Us boys would get something nice. When we were little, it was usually a nice pair, a nice coat with a bow tie and some shorts. <laughs> get a middle picture of this, if you will. <clears throat> but we got something new, and we... Besides the Easter Bunny, whatever the Easter Bunny was going to bring, we looked forward to Easter because we knew we were going to get a new change of clothes, a new outfit. So it was something that we looked forward to as children when I was growing up in the 50s and 60s. <clears throat> Way back when, before y'all were born. But you know what? Just like the commercialization of Christmas, <clears throat> unfortunately, the world, our world anyway, not the world necessarily, but our world has commercialized Easter to the point that most of the, of, of the people in the United States, many of the people in the United States have no clue what Easter is about other than the Easter Bunny. <laughs> And hiding Easter eggs and, and getting candy and, and gifts for Easter. But that's not what Easter is about at all. It isn't getting ready for the Easter Bunny, but it's preparing our hearts and minds to be reminded of the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. And listen, more than that, that it's what happened three days later, because on Friday he was dead, but on Sunday he was alive. And that's what we celebrate Easter. That's what it's all about. That's why we celebrate. <clears throat> so today I want us to look at a passage of scripture. Second Corinthians 5.17 is our, is our key verse. One of the things that I didn't anticipate is how small the print is. <clears throat> Second Corinthians five seventeen <clears throat> says this. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new. Say it out loud. Creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. <clears throat> Father, I pray that you would use these words and this message for your honor and for your glory. Father, I pray that as we study your word today and see the things that you make new on Easter, that we might see the importance of really understanding the true meaning of Easter in our lives today. Father, hide me behind the cross. Let them see Jesus and only him. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <coughs> well, we get a lot of new stuff as a Christian because Jesus died on the cross and arose from the dead. 
<clears throat> and so today I want to look at some of this new stuff that we get. The first one is that we, we get a new creation. He makes, because of his death, burial, and resurrection, he makes a new creation. <clears throat> and in that new creation, what we get is a new person, a new self. That passage that we just read, put that back up, Wayne, if you would. <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. <clears throat> I want you to pay attention to that because that is a significant passage of Scripture. <clears throat> Theologians have debated this passage of Scripture for years and years and years. People have argued and said that if we are indeed a new creation, then how come we continue to sin? The Apostle Paul spent a lot of time talking about this. He said if, if we are new creations, then we no longer have that, that thing that's within us that is a bent to sin. But he also writes, the things that I don't want to do, I do, and the things that I do, I don't want to do. And he said, I find this other law operating inside of me. And it's a constant struggle. For the guy that wrote most of the New Testament, it was a constant struggle to combat that old nature, that old man, that old Adam, that has been replaced by the new man, the new Adam. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So we get a new creation, a new self. <clears throat> he writes to the church at Ephesus in Ephesus 4, 22 to 24. He says, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Listen, <clears throat> when Jesus died on the cross, and when we become an heir, <clears throat> a joint heir with Jesus Christ, something happens. That old nature goes away. That old man is replaced by a new nature. <clears throat> but there's a constant struggle that's going on. And, and Paul says that we need to put away that old nature. He says, put off your old self. What this tells me is that we have a responsibility. It's a, it's a cooperative effort here. Christ's righteousness is what we put on. Look, <clears throat> when God looks at me, he doesn't see my righteousness. He doesn't see my righteousness. He doesn't see my sin. He doesn't see my good works. What he sees is the righteousness of Jesus Christ, much like I might put on a coat or a vest, and it covers what's underneath that. That is what God sees when he looks at us. But we have a responsibility in this transformation process that is taking place every day. Yes. The theological term for this is sanctification. Yes. <clears throat> and it is a process of going from where we were to where God wants us to be. And it is a journey. It is a struggle. It is a process that lasts our entire life. Say that. Say that. It lasts our entire life. <coughs> I know my brother preached that we that we can be perfect. And in theory that's true. <clears throat> but in fact, that doesn't operate in my life. When I look at my life, I don't see myself being perfect. <coughs> In fact, when I look in my life, I see myself so far from perfection that I can't even see it from here. The only way I can see it is when I look at Jesus Christ. I want you to understand this. This is, this is very difficult. It's a very difficult theological process that's taking place here. It's, it's, it's difficult for us to understand, and it's even hard to put it into language that makes it easy to understand. There's another verse I want to read, Colossians 3, 9 and 10. It says, do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. <clears throat> it 
in both of those passages of Scripture, we see the word renewed. Being renewed. This is the process. And you know what? It's an everyday thing. We've got to renew ourselves daily. Yes. It's kind of like, it's kind of like, you know, you, you have to, you can't say, well, I ate yesterday, so I'm not going to eat today. That's a little ridiculous, isn't it? Because what you ate yesterday was good for yesterday, but today you need more food. If you don't, then what happens is you die. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the truth. It's what happens. So this process of renewal is very much like the process of retaining your strength through a process of renewing your mind. It regain, you regain your spiritual strength when you renew your mind. <clears throat> so what I'm saying here is, is that he makes a new creation but that new creation has to be sustained. Now the good news, we're going to see this a little later in this, in this sermon, the good news is, is that we don't have to do that by ourselves. But there is, there is a part of that that we are required to do ourselves. And God will work on the other stuff. It's a cooperative effort. So the first thing we see is he makes a new creation. The second thing that we see is he makes a new covenant. Now stay with me. Because we're going we're gonna to develop this a little further as we go on. The new covenant is a blood covenant like, the old, like in the Old Testament. Because any time that God cuts a covenant with his people, it requires the shedding of blood. Atonement for sin requires the shedding of blood. Forgiveness of sin requires the shedding of blood. But the new covenant, Jesus says is different than the Old Covenant. <clears throat> because the Old Covenant was temporary. The Old Covenant expired. The Old Covenant required the high priest to sacrifice, the, the, the people to sacrifice a lamb on the altar every year for the atonement of sin. And the blood was spilled, and, and, and literally they had rivers that flowed out from the temple. <laughs> They, they, they actually cut ditches where this blood would flow from the temple as these animals were being sacrificed for the atonement for sin for the people of Israel. And they had to do it every year, every year, every year. But when Jesus died on the cross, when Jesus died on the cross, no more sacrifice was required. Because Jesus' blood shed on that cross was the final payment for our sin. I want you to understand this. <clears throat> In Luke 22, 20, these are Jesus' words. <clears throat> and likewise, the cup after they had eaten, Jesus took the cup and said, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. The new covenant in my blood. You see, when God cut a covenant, when God created a covenant or made a covenant with man, he literally cut the covenant. And we read in the Old Testament that when God made a covenant back then, that, that, that the animal was sacrifices and the pieces were set apart, and they literally walked through the pieces of the sacrifice. So the idea of cutting a covenant involves the shedding of blood. And Jesus said, even before his death, these words were spoken on the Last Supper. He says, this covenant is the new covenant in my blood. We don't like to talk about blood. We don't like to handle blood. We don't like bloody things. Yeah. But praise God, our Savior was willing to shed his blood for the atonement of our sins. The new covenant is a blood covenant. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 11.25 In the same way also, this is the Apostle Paul relating what happened. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. <clears throat> but the new covenant is also a better covenant. The new covenant is also a better covenant, and it's a better covenant because of two things. First of all, because of the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 3.6 says this, Who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant, there's that word, new covenant. Not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter, 
the letter he's referring to here is the law. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. This new covenant is better because, remember I said we had a responsibility, <clears throat> but we also have to realize that we don't do this by ourselves. That God's spirit indwells each one of us. Now, you know, we always come down hard on the Israelites. From the time that first covenant was made with Abraham, <clears throat> we read in the Old Testament time after time again, the people of Israel turning away from God and worshiping false idols, turning away from God and, and, and developing uh, idols of their own and, and adopting those, those customs and practices of the people around them. And we give them a hard time for that, but you've got to remember something. They didn't have the presence of the Holy Spirit within them to guide their steps every day. Now, the presence of God was in their midst, but he wasn't inside of them. When they went from place to place, the Holy Spirit, when they went from place to place as individuals, the Holy Spirit didn't go with them everywhere they went. He wasn't there in the times of temptation. He wasn't there in the times of weakness. You understand this? We have an advantage through this new covenant that the people of Israel never had in that old covenant. And that is we have the presence of the Holy Spirit to guide us, to show us the right way, to help us make the right choice. But the new covenant is a better covenant not only for that, but also because of the Savior. Hebrews 9.15 says this, Therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant, so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Jesus is the perfect sacrifice. No other sacrifice is required. <clears throat> Listen, that's why all of our sins are forgiven. You need to hear this. All of our sins are forgiven. Past sins, present sins, and future sins are forgiven. When Jesus died on the cross, his arms stretched out, his body beaten and broken, he cried out, It is finished. Sin had been atoned. The payment had been made. And the sin that you are yet to commit, the sin that is still out there in your future, has already been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ if you're a child of His. You need to understand this. I, I know people who are so afraid, and maybe it's a good thing, it might be a good thing, they're so afraid to sin because they're afraid, what happens if I sin and then... You know, if I, if I say a curse word and then somebody whacks me in their car and I die, then I don't have, that sin hasn't been forgiven. Brothers and sisters, you don't need to fret about that. Your sin is forgiven. Now, the Apostle Paul said, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, he said. Look, it doesn't give us a license to sin. It gives us a license to make the right choices. But, 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 you've got to understand this. If you do sin, you are covered. Jesus Christ is our insurance policy. If you make a mistake, you have coverage. And it's complete coverage. It's 100% coverage. Because Jesus Christ died for all of our sins. The sins of the world, even the sins that are yet to be committed. Jesus' blood has paid the penalty for all sins. So not only does he make a new covenant and a new creation, but he also makes a new command. <clears throat> John 13, 34 says, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. You know, I thought about this <coughs> a little bit. Because <clears throat> God had already given us a commandment to love one another. In the Old Testament, God had given us a commandment. It's back in Deuteronomy. Let me read it to you. Put that up. It says, this is, this is the call of Shema, this part right here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Okay? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And here it is. These words that I command you today 
shall be all your heart. So there was already a commandment to love God. But when Jesus came, <clears throat> when Jesus came, he said this, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. That's the Matthew 22 uh, passage, Wayne, if you put that up. With all your mind, this is the great and first commandment. Now look at this. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> now, what am I trying to say here? Jesus said, a new command I give you. And the difference between this command and all the previous commands is that, is that the previous commands were given without demonstration. You go back and look in the book of Exodus, and read the Ten Commandments. They aren't the Ten Suggestions. They're the Ten Commandments. But God never said, let me show you how to do it. He said, these are the commandments. And you've got to obey these commands. But when Jesus came and said, I give you a new commandment, let's go back to that passage again. In John 13, 34. He says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. And if you have your Bible open to this, underline this, just as I have loved you. You see, Jesus gave us a commandment with an example. He didn't just say love one another. He said love one another as I have loved you. So you also are to love one another. In other words, follow my example, and just as I have loved you, you must also love one another. So this new command gives us not only the thing to do, but a, but a way to learn how to do it. To sh that he shows us how to do it. So we have a new creation. We have a new covenant. We have a new command, but we also have a new kingdom. He makes a new kingdom. 2 Peter 3.13. But according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. <clears throat> and in Revelation 21.1, <clears throat> John, seeing the revelation from God, writes these words, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. God has promised us a new kingdom in which to dwell. It is a heavenly kingdom, and yet it is also an earthly kingdom. Because we know from reading the scripture that God's plan is that we don't dwell forever with him in heaven, but we dwell forever with him on a new earth, which will be heaven, because wherever God is, that is heaven. You understand what I'm saying here? You need to hear this very carefully. This kingdom is out there, and this is the thing that gives us hope. The book of Revelation has, has aptly been called a tract for hard times. When you're struggling with difficult circumstances in your life, when you're dealing with issues that seem beyond you, you need to remember that God is preparing for you a place that is perfect. There'll be no more struggle. There'll be no more pain. There'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more miscarriages. There'll be no more sickness. There'll be no more death. It is a place that is perfect, and God has prepared it for those who are called according to his purpose. It is for you and it is for me. And it is out there and it is the hope that we can cling to when, when life seems hopeless. It is the hope that we can cling to when life seems unfair. It is the hope that we can cling to when life throws us a curveball. When Windows 7 operating system came out, Apple computers took great delight in pointing out a negative feature of Windows. Because if you've installed a program on your computer, 
if you have Windows 7 and you've installed a computer, uh, a program on your computer, then you know that before it allows the program to be installed, it asks you, do you want to, you have to approve the change. You have to say yes or no. You can say cancel and nothing will happen. Well, folks, just like Windows 7, just like Windows 7, you have to approve the change. You see, God is gentleman enough that he doesn't cram this down your throats. You have to accept it. You have a responsibility to receive what God has for you. You have a responsibility to take hold of this thing that God has provided for you. You need to learn how to take hold of this. It's so important. God does not make you accept these things. He offers them to you, and you have to say yes. I'll accept it. Likewise, God does not make you accept him. The term for this is called free will. God has given us the choice. But if we want to experience a new creation and a new covenant and a new, uh, a new command and a new kingdom, then we've got to accept what God is offering to us through his son, Jesus Christ. We have to approve it. We have to say, I accept these changes in my life. And when we do, we find that God can do some amazing things. The transformation, if it's real, will be evident in the lives, in your lives and in my life. Look, we were talking about this in Sunday school. We were talking about how we have, as, 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 as we've seen this church grow and people come to faith in Christ, how God's Spirit has drawn people in and the step-by-step -step process that that is. It's, it's just amazing when you look back on it and you see what God has brought us through and, where, and how God has operated in various and sundry circumstances that in and of themselves don't seem significant, but when you put them all together, they, they, they spell out a story that's pretty amazing. How God has brought people who were lost to a place where they're now serving Him faithfully. Anna was there when we were talking about how the Short family came to our church. Some of you, most of you know the story, but let me let me relate it to you. And I'm not going to tarry here. This is I'm going to close right after this. But Mary. Reyes started coming because mom and dad decided to get right with God. And they, they were coming and they finally encouraged Mary to come and for a short while she was attending our church. And her daughter, Elise, started coming. And when mom dropped off a little bit, Elise kept coming because grandma and grandpa kept going and picking them up. And one day she fell in love with a man named Robert, a boy named Robert. Right. <laughs> he was 15, I think, or 16 at the time. And Elise invited him to come to church. And about that time, Robert's mom, Anna, was looking for something for the boys to do. And Robert said, well, you know, they have a children's <coughs> program while we have the youth program going on. Why don't you bring the kids? to the church, and so Anna would come and bring the boys, and they would go to the children's thing. Robert would go with the leash to the, to the youth thing, and Anna would sit in the foyer. <clears throat> Anna would sit in the foyer. And we wouldn't be heavy-handed about it, but we would encourage her to come in to the Bible study that was going on here for the adults, and she would quietly decline, and that was okay. And then one day she did come in, and she sat on the very back row. And then God began to speak to her heart. And she came back a little bit more and a little bit more. And God was working in her life. And her husband came back from a deployment. And might I say he was a little messed up. May I say that? Is that your testimony? I don't want to steal your thunder, brother. <laughs> I'd like to say something real quick. You what, say it, brother. Go for it. What the pastor's preaching that is a testimony in my life. As I was dealing with a lot of turmoil, 
And it's like Windows 7, that analogy is great because you have to choose that choice. I've never had such peace in a state of mind in my life right now by having God take the reins. And the story that he's talking about that led our family in the way it did is just, that's where I try to give everything I have of my love for God and for Christ because why would he even want anything for me? And that was my thought process then. But just as the pastor said during praise and worship, you know, he loves us that much. And I've never had such peace. The sky's the limit. I'm so excited for that new kingdom. You know, the prayers that he answers in our family's life, we could probably be here way past lunch. I give you just one after another. It's, uh, it's so amazing. I'm stepping into service because I owe God. I mean, that's when I wake up in the morning, that's, that's the least I can do. And, uh, you know, this, how we came to this church, this church is so unique in the fact that you can come just as broken as Christ tells us to be. We are so broken. Come. And th this environment is just so easy for you to come in jacked up, as we like to say in the military. And just if you let God do his thing, you can just seep it in and listen. But you have to make that window of seven, yes or no. I, I was playing cancel cancel you know it, it interfered with what I thought was my life but my life was just a shambles you know I, I really didn't like people unfortunately that's just the the area the step I went into uh, I kind of served in many facets in the army and I just couldn't quite understand people from where I morally was brought up and uh, but little did I know you know the enemy is just pulling the strings you know in my life and uh, when, I, when I found Jesus truly through this church, it took some time because I was pressing cancels rather than pressing yes. He just snipped the string. And uh, I, you know, every we've got a lot of soldiers in here, and I know what they've dealt with with PTSD. Uh, there's a lot of soldiers in here been diagnosed with PTSD. It's a stigma in the military. You know, if you get it, you know, big deal. Suck it up, drive on. I, I, I turned uh, drinking some whiskey at night so I go to sleep. You know, I had a loving wife that just said, hey, you know, you need to, you need to figure something out. Took me to this church. Uh, at the time, I couldn't stop on my own. And that's where I realized that I had to lay everything at Jesus' feet. It, it, it went away overnight. I'm not kidding you. I mean, I woke up thinking my mouth would be salvating, but it was wanting to just praise him. It, it was ridiculous. What this church, what God is doing with this church, I mean, it's to me, it's a revelation every day. Every 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 chance I get to operate and move in this church, the leaders and what the Lord's doing with our leaders in this church, as well as the congregation, I want to serve in the facet of telling you how I went about my turmoil and just show you how easy it is to just cross over, push yes on that Windows 7 command prompt, and let her rip because. I, you know, like I said, we'd be here well after lunch to tell you what he's done for our family. Uh, to including our son, our last son, that was supposed to be born with all kinds of illnesses. The God taught us about faith in that facet. It, we said, doctors, we don't want any tests. We're done. No more. You know, if the Lord wants us to have this child with this illness, then there's a purpose behind it. You know, but the Lord said, I, I've got different plans for you. And our son was born completely healthy. But, uh, like I said, that's just the beginning. So, sorry. I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to uh, intrude on their life, but their life is such an example of what I'm talking about. Yes. Here's a man who has now been ordained as a deacon in our church, and his wife came to me last week. So, got a book. His wife Anna, who used to sit in the foyer and wouldn't come into the Bible study, came to me last week, actually two weeks ago, and said, "I need you to give me a Bible study because I'm going to start a Bible study in my home." There's a flyer in your bulletin about a ladies' Bible study that's going to start tomorrow at 10 o'clock in their home, and you're invited, ladies, if you have if you have opportunity to go. She's going to lead a Bible study. This is a lady that wouldn't come into a Bible study and now going to be leading a Bible study. This is the transformation, the power of the Holy Spirit and the transformation process when we submit ourselves to God and say, God, use us. Her testimony was his testimony, and that is that she used to drink a lot when he was deployed. That's how she dealt with the loneliness and the frustration of that. And she said that overnight, 
God took the desire away for alcohol. He was drinking a gallon of, of, of whiskey every three days. And overnight, God took the desire of alcohol away. God can do that. That's the change that, had, that takes place here, brothers and sisters. That's what I'm talking about. So as we think about Easter, and we think about what Easter represents, let's forget about getting ready for the Easter Bunny and get ready to proclaim the good news that Jesus Christ has died on the cross, that he's, that he's risen from the dead, and that he is alive. And if you ask me how I know he lives, he lives right here. He lives within my heart. And that's the truth. Oh, 